Everything should be working. Okay. Welcome back to another episode of Reels Like the First Time. My journey trying to experience all that film has to offer, the good and the bad, for the very first time. And joining me today to talk 2017's A Ghost Story is host for the podcast and YouTube channel First Cut, it's Ace Cabrera. Hi, Ace. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I'm really excited about this. I always get very excited when I realize I'm having someone on who wants to talk about an A24 film because I never know what I'm going to get. Like the first A24 film I covered on here with, um, I was with Dan Nye and we discussed, uh, what was it? Uh, Swiss Army Man. So Mm. (laughs) a movie that just starts with him riding a farting corpse back yes. home from a stranded island. So I love that I never know what I'm going to get with A24. So I'm really excited to have you on with this. But before we kind of dive all into it, just to tell everyone a little bit about yourself, where did your love for movies come from? Yeah, I feel like it came from obviously my childhood, but Definitely my parents, I think, have had a big effect on me. I feel like my my family definitely loved movies like a lot of families did. And growing up and watching specific films during the 90s definitely hit the chord with me on a special level. So, yeah, 90s films, watching those movies as a kid, growing up with those films uh, uh-huh. was definitely uh, what got me into it for sure. What would some of those 90s films entail? Are we talking like blank check 90s films are we talking about the prequel trilogy for star wars i mean wars? those two <laughs> yeah uh, i feel like i loved blank check as a kid for yeah, sure it's a great movie <laughs> but when it comes to awe and wonder it was definitely jurassic park was definitely the biggest one for me when i was youngest that's probably sure. the youngest one where i remember and then obviously the sequels i mean the prequels uh were amazing watching those as a kid so yeah for sure for sure those i mean there's like an independence day in there uh there's there's a lot there's a lot of good films in the 90s for sure that's awesome so when i reached out to you to have you on the show i sent you the list of of ideas and suggestions that i have wanting to cover um but i always tell everyone i'm open to any and all suggestions and you came back with wanting to talk about david lowry's directed uh, 2017 film, uh, A Ghost Story. So why this movie specifically? Uh, several reasons. I feel like one of the biggest reasons is mainly because most people haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's a big one. I feel like, you know, everyone's seen the big popular movies or the films that everyone sure. should watch. And you can check those lists out anywhere on any movie show or podcast. But I feel like when it comes to this specific movie, it's kind of unseen. It's kind mm-hmm. of forgotten. And it's, I think it's a special film and I think it's a really unique, low budget, beautiful film that a lot of people haven't seen. And it really struck a chord with me when I first Mm -hmm. saw it back in 2017. So yeah, I feel like this is one I always recommend to people when people ask me to recommend a film to them. It's so so funny you talk about like, you know, being kind of forgotten. I had told you uh, when I went to go watch it or when we, you know, confirmed the date and everything, um, you had mentioned how, you know, it was on Amazon Prime. And I was like, oh, apparently I own it. So like even my husband had bought it at like one of those, he, you know, he loves the Best Buy like Black Friday sales where it's like a buy one, get one on Blu-rays and it was just part of one of those sales that he got and he it ended up on our shelves and we he's never watched it i didn't even know we had it so um i think it kind of like speaks to that point of like it's just it's a movie that once you see it it sits with you and it like like it's still sitting with me but you're right if it, uh, there i feel like not a whole lot of people really know about it or they don't know They just remember seeing what Casey Affleck looks like in a giant sheet. (laughs) And that's all they know about it. Yeah, I feel like it's definitely, I I wouldn't say off-putting, but like quirky enough to, quirky enough where it doesn't let people in. Where it it makes you feel like, I don't want to watch this. This is too weird. But once you get past that, I feel like you kind of accept it and then realize what the film is trying to do. So, mm-hmm. And it's really not even like the weirdest A24 film I've I agree. seen. Like, I mean, I loved everything everywhere all at once. I just talked about it on on 
the previous episode, um, great movie, Hot Dog Fingers are Weird AF. Like, like I would say that one's more quirky than even uh, this one is. Um, but I also then, I went to go, I started doing a deep dive on like what else David Lowry has done. Um, and I realized from learning on that as IMDb, he also did The Green Knight. Yes. And I went and saw that in theaters. I went, that makes sense. Like there's yes. just certain things <laughs> when a director does something, you're just like, Oh, I get it. I can see it now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when did you see The Green Knight? We saw it. We actually saw that in theaters. My husband was. Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah. My husband was. It was one of those movies that, because it was supposed to come out like pre-pandemic shutdown. Mm-hmm. And he was super excited about the story. Like he knows like the whole backstory about it being this tale that I think was like, what was it? It was like transcribed or like translated by um, J.R.R. Tolkien. Um and so he knew all about it and he was so excited for it. So when they finally released it, like he was like, we have to go see this. It's going to be amazing. And I was like, cool. Perfect. And again, you talk about weird shit. Like I didn't know the story. I didn't know anything about it. So all these things that are going on that I'm like, I don't understand. I thought it was fantastic. I want to go back yes. and rewatch it now. But <laughs> again, you talk about weird A24 movies. And I think that one is probably going to be up there a little bit higher than um, than, than a ghost story. Uh, but even speaking about that, um, I think the other thing that's so important to talk about with this movie is the music and its use of music over dialogue. Yeah. I mean, it, it, just music in general. I, I'm realizing now what it takes when it comes to filmmaking the power of score is just unmatched the fact that this movie has so many shots that are just a camera on a tripod and it's just sitting there (laughs) but the fact that you feel so much emotion because of the music where the score is just going as hard as hell and you're just sitting there watching a single shot of a guy Mm -hmm. in a in a ghost costume that's made out of sheets all kinds, so sheets. many sheets. <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's like, I, yet I feel so much emotion. What's going on right now? And I feel like a lot of that is score. Score is yes. so heavy in this movie to the point that it's a part of the film as well. It's a part of the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful score too. I was even, um, I, I listened, I was listening to it on my drive home from work today just to kind of remind myself like how it was and how it's very, it comes across very classical in some sense uh, with like some of the song, some of the music with it, but it is just, especially with those long shots. Like this is one of those movies that they do that whole, like they sit in a scene and just staring at somebody for five minutes and it's just there. And you're just to the point where like, it's almost uncomfortable. (laughs) Like the, I mean, the, the, the best example is the pie scene where she sits down and just is scarfing this pie. I mean, at one point I was like, I didn't know what to do. Like, do I keep watching? Do I do I look at my phone now? Like, can I check my messages? Like, I don't I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I feel like it's, I mean, obviously everyone has their own viewing experience, but I feel like that's definitely part of the film mm-hmm. is having, fighting the urge to move and just fighting mm-hmm. the urge to look away. Because I I'm really good at and I and it's like a a thing that I've I've done to myself because I'm a film purist in general where uh-huh. I go watch movies in theaters obviously I didn't see this one in theaters though but I'm a film purist when I don't look at my phone at all yeah uh, and and I'm just so locked in so I was just locked and the movie's short too so it was kind of easy right. it's not a three hour film but I yeah. could just sit and watch the whole binge the whole thing in one sitting and I just lock myself in and I've force myself to feel everything the characters are feeling, which I think was the point of that scene. Yeah. And because the way that this movie just shows grief and how it's not, everyone's grief is, is different. And you know, the way that like the friend who comes and drops off the pie and then leaves a note says, I'm so sorry, by the way, let me know when, when I can send painters out. Like who wants to read that? Like she just lost her, her, her partner and her spouse. And like, they had been talking about moving, but I feel like we could, you know, I feel like we could hold off a little bit, like for, for a quick second in that sense. 
Yeah. Can, can I actually jump in? I, I'm just so yeah. curious because, again, this is something I've, I've done before uh, where I recommend the ghost story to a lot of people. I'm just curious to know your general thoughts because I, I'm yeah it's not for everyone right i mean i'm not expecting everyone to be like yo man thanks for the recommendation that was awesome sure i'm curious to hear your thoughts about the film um i think it was a very beautifully made film that is very much a it looks at life and death in a certain way and i think that the the moments where I get to be made uncomfortable and like I think it sends you through your own existential crisis at a certain point like the scene where it's the house party is going on and this guy is going on this long rant to the woman and her friends who like she's like oh I'm not gonna I haven't finished my book I don't think I'm gonna do it and he's basically telling her cool don't because no one's gonna give a shit because all of this is gonna get sucked into a black hole anyway and life is meaningless <laughs> is like what that boils down to and it's so heavy in that part but then they cut away to people laughing and having fun and dancing and you just keep going through like this spiral of of life and where it ends up going and i think for as heavy of a subject as he as David Lowry wrote and and put together, you then just have this thing of Casey Affleck in a, in a bed sheet, just standing there watching and it almost like takes it away from it because it's such a comical looking thing just standing there. And it and it's so I don't know, it was just I just thought it was absolutely stunning and beautiful and heavy. Um do I think this is something I'm readily going to go back to on a daily basis, <laughs> like anytime soon? Honestly, I probably not just because parts of it are so heavy. I don't know if I'm, I feel like this is a movie that I'm going to have to be in the right mindset for because I had no idea what this story was. I refused to watch. One of the things when I don't know anything about a movie, when I'm covering on this show, I don't watch trailers. I don't watch like nothing. I just want to like go straight into it and i'm really glad i went into this blind because i was so just enthralled and intrigued with these long shots and just waiting for the next thing to happen but when the next thing does happen it's not always exciting and it's not it's just like and we move on with life and i think it just shows how everything just kind of goes the grieving process and moving forward and moving on it was just that's my long-winded way of saying i'm really grateful you suggested this movie because i never would have sought it out on my own and i'm really glad that i watched it got it yeah i'll take it i'll take it as a positive i went down this whole long way of saying like oh yeah thanks um so what is anyway it's like so really kind of in that sense like what was what went through your mind the first time that you watched this as well like did you know anything about it did you have any idea of like what the story was no 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 not at all i feel like a24 was just kicking into high gear at that point in 2017. Mm-hmm. 2017 it feels so long ago. When you said so that I you ago. made me feel like so old. I was like it's wild. no way. I thought this was like 3 years ago. <laughs> yeah, no, for real. Like I that makes it's like you literally saying 20, that's the year that I got married. So like I'm about to go on to like my 6th wedding anniversary. Like it's the way that t- and I think that's the other thing that this movie does is it just shows like the way that they just fast forward through time oh, and like yeah. how it just really like swoops by and it's all done in just a shot of just like a quick rotation. Um, but anyway, back to when you first <laughs> saw a ghost story. Yeah, no, I, d- I definitely wanted to see it for sure. And I, I remember watching the trailer, which I remember a lot of, I, I don't know how online you were during film Twitter during that time, mm-hmm. but everyone's reaction to that trailer was something special for sure where everyone was like, what the hell is this? Uh-huh. Um, it's it's a guy in a, in a bed sheet acting like a ghost. It's so dumb. But I, w- I remember being like, oh, I have to see this movie. And then I went yeah. out, sought it out. The first thing that stood out to me, I definitely can't lie, was the 4-3 aspect ratio. Yes. I don't know what yeah. you thought of that. I thought that was really interesting. I like when – I do like a, a change in, in ratio. And again, I think – and I also like the way that the – they did the corners to it, it's the more the rounded corners than yes. just the square box. So it really is like you're looking at a home movie and you're watching through life. And I actually have for, um, again, going into our, if it's on Wikipedia, it's true <laughs> part of, of the episode um, that the supposedly 
um, David Lowry wanted to make people feel like claustrophobic and boxed in, which is why he did the ratio that he did for this movie. Yeah, I, I thought it was something unique as well. And it definitely stood out within the movie. And I feel like it adds to, again, the story and the message mm -hmm. and the themes in the film. Yeah. Who do you like if you really like dived into it and like really thought about it? Who do you think was the ghost in the flower sheet that was like next door that he kept like communicating to? Like, do you think it was someone who lived in that house or someone who was just like when they go back to like the pioneer day and he sees everyone get killed by Indians, like someone from then? Like, did you have you ever really thought about that? Because that's where my mind goes. <laughs> No, I, I I assumed it was just another neighbor or another person who yeah. was going through the same thing he was and he could communicate with them. Uh, did you laugh during that scene? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I was like, what? Is, of course, like, because in my head, the, the the immediate thing I thought of watching that scene is the rock scene and everything everywhere all at once where you're just communicating yes. through the subtitles and just... This is the other. OG everything everywhere all at once existential crisis film. It uh, really is. It but really yeah, I, I thought it was just a different perspective in a different way. Yeah. I, I thought it was, I mean, it was horrifically sad. I don't know if you yeah. you felt that as well, but I felt sad uh, like, considering that what they're feeling. Yeah. The music that's playing during that time mm -hmm. is just heartbreaking stuff. Um, you know, I, I also think it's really interesting too. Um, another note that I, I learned according to Wikipedia, um, because of how the costume was made and what it was, it's, it's, it's a bunch of bed sheets. So it really kind of impeded a lot of the movements or it would cling to it. Just David Lowry didn't like how it looked when Casey Affleck would be moving a whole bunch. So a whole, it had to be kind of changed around to where every movement is very purposeful and very like done. Like when he's throwing the dishes with the family that's in the house and it's like, he's angry that they're there and he just starts like throwing everything to get them out. But like all those movements are so purposeful because he didn't like how it ended up looking with like the sheet just draping on him in certain ways. Cause it shows like every single feature, um, which I thought is really, really, and I love that. I also love that he, he did this movie because he always just wanted to do something with a person looking like a ghost with the bed sheets. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I feel like if that's, uh, I mean, obviously Scooby-Doo was, was yeah. <laughs> that's where I know it from. Cause I grew up with Scooby-Doo. Right. Right. But I feel like that's if, if that's something you you have in your head, right? As a child, mm -hmm. that's your imagination of a ghost. Then maybe that's something you come up with when you're an actual ghost. Right. I just felt like that was kind of a interesting aspect for sure. I I loved it. And I loved how it just it just starts with, you know, he's on he's on the gurney and she you know looks at him and then she covers him back up and then he wakes up and that's the sheet that he's just walking through. I'm. It, I mean, it's haunting in a way that you're just like, but it also takes some seriousness out of it by being like, it's Casey Affleck in a cheat. <laughs> like, that's all it is. Um, I also really love that, um, again, when he was like, apparently, according to, according to Wikipedia, when he was writing the movie, he started writing it because he... And his wife had been talking about moving and she wanted to move, but he didn't. And so that's again, so like he starts having this whole like existential crisis between this move and reading a news article about how like the world's going to end by a giant earthquake in however many years. So through all of that comes a ghost story, <laughs> which look, if that's going to help your existential crisis, like why not? You know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I love David Lowry, not just in this movie, but as a filmmaker in general. That's why uh, A Green Knight is one of my favorite films of that year. I think I made my oh, top yeah. three. Uh, and I thought that was a beautiful film with so much to say as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I really do feel he also did uh, Old Man with a Gun and then Pete's Dragon, uh, okay. which is interesting. But it, it's definitely an array of films, a range, I guess you could say, yeah. of films. Well and everything he does, I, I will say, at least between like the one, the two that I have seen between a ghost story and, and the green Knight, both visually stunning. Yes. Um, especially when you're talking about the, I mean, I know we're not talking about the green Knight, but I feel like you just have to with like this scenery and the, the, with where they're at, like, you know, in this English country or wherever they are. But I think both films do a really good job of just showing just, I, I mean, just, they're just absolutely 
stunning visuals. Yeah. Um, no, especially he's, in the house. Yeah, he's an amazing filmmaker. And I think that's what, what makes the film special to me, a, a different kind of special. Because mm -hmm. obviously this is something that a lot of people might ignore. But to me, this one, I, I, I don't know if this is true. Maybe because I don't know if you have the Wikipedia pulled up. but I think Of it course. Was, Nothing but the, nothing but professionals around here with getting all of our facts off of Wikipedia. But I think it won the Gotham Super Indie Award, where it's like the micro budget indie award. Uh, Let me see. Because there's there's two indie awards. There's an indie award for what's considered an indie, which I think is like twenty mil, or uh -huh. 10, 15 mil, and then there's a micro budget indie, which is considered I think like two mil and under. But, okay. Or five mil and under. And this one won that award. And I think a lot of it had to do with the budget of the film, which I think was like 800 grand, I want to say. Yeah, it was really, million. really low. Like it was, I, I that I do have up here. Um, let's see. So production, um, maybe, maybe I have it on here. Um, I can't find it particularly, but I think it was relatively lower budget for sure. Um, but I don't know by how much. I could always Google it. Um, yeah, uh, it says on on Wikipedia it says a hundred grand, which yeah. is insane. <laughs> insane. But yeah, but it won the. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right because I was watching it. But it won that award of like the micro budget indie. Award. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, critics prize, jury prize. Uh, yeah, but essentially what I, what I'm trying to get to is the fact that this movie is so low budget. Like, yes. How do you make a movie with this such a low budget? Most filmmakers nowadays would say it's impossible. Mm -hmm. It's literally impossible. Whereas David Lowry said, I I'm about to spit like, like, yeah, you know, everyone stand back. I'm about to cook right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he did with like such a low budget, and I think that's what makes him to me even more of a special film and even more of a mm -hmm. special filmmaker, where he's literally given pebbles and he's just like doing some crazy stuff with the pebbles. And I'm like, yo, this guy's crazy to do that much. Yeah, with and this low of a budget, it's insane. Well, because like, I also think so. Part of it too, like with with the filming, is they filmed it the house that they filmed it in when they had to do like reshoots or everything, it's like, it was getting ready to be demolished. So like they got to go in like for like four days or whatever it was and finish like all the filming they needed to do before it's, I think for free because the house was getting demolished. So there was no one to pay for it. It was just, it was, it was going down. Um, so that's super smart right there. I also love the tidbit that it was so secretive when this movie was being made and because he wanted it to like, he didn't want to put too much out there like, with, you know, the idea that like, maybe it wouldn't happen that until like the November or so before it was released or like right before Sundance or whatever it was, was when it was announced that it was Rooney Mara and Casey Affleck. But, like nobody knew anything about it other than like a movie was being made. Yeah. And I feel like that is another super underrated aspect of this mm -hmm. film that on a second rewatch you can see this would not work <laughs> if no. it was not if it was not Rooney Mara it, because Rooney yeah. Mara is an absolute monster I think she's one of the best actresses working right Absolutely. now and that's why she's so specific with her projects this is post girl with a dragon tattoo mm -hmm. so I was already like on the Mo Rooney Mara train I think that's part of the reason why I saw it too because I was like anything that Rooney Mara's in I'm gonna watch mm -hmm. which is still something that I keep to this day. Yeah. Uh, she's incredible. And the fact that, I mean, obviously we'll get to, to the best scenes, but the ma majority of them to me are with her because I do feel like she carries a lot of the emotional weight of the film. So. Absolutely. And it's all done. The, the, all of these emotional beats again are done with little to no dialogue. It's these, yes. emo it's facial features. Yeah. It's standing at the counter to e start eating a pie. And then, grabbing it and sitting on it because who hasn't just like emotionally binged an entire anything um she's she's absolutely incredible. she's her not being nominated for any sort of acting thing for women talking i was furious about because she was amazing in that along yes. with oh god who else was in that um i remember going to say that and i was like obsessed but between her and claire foy oh, um man. 
neither one of them being nominated for anything, I was furious. But both of them are, both of them are Liz. Uh, Liz I Beth- know. Oh, <laughs> uh, what's her name in a uh, girl with a dragon tattoo? It's Liz, right? Lizbeth. Yeah, Lizbeth Solander. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bo- both of them are Elizabeth. Yeah, I love that. But yeah, it's just kind of one of those things where I'm like, that may- when you talk about Rooney Mara just being incredible and yeah. in the things that she does, and I love when an I love when an actor is selective about them. Like, granted, I also love an actor that has like fuck you money that will just do like the dumbest things, like Johnny Depp and and the, half the shit that he does. I enjoy that too to like just go and do these passion projects, whatever, and give me a paycheck. But people who know their talent and know their skill set and are very selective, I think is should also be commended because it means when they take a part, they're going to do everything they can to make it be one of the best uh, performances ever. When you're, yeah, when you're an artist at that level, I do feel like part of it, I mean, obviously I'm not an actor. I can't speak too much to what it is to be inside that world and I don't want to mm-hmm. be in it. Thank you very nope. much. No, thank um, you. <laughs> but at the same time, I do feel like a lot of people might see that as being picky. I, I see it as being conscious, conscious yeah. of what you want to do with your career, conscious of what you want to represent. I know Rooney and, and Joaquin, I think, I don't know if they're still together, but I know they are very conscious of trying to make films that mm-hmm. speak to them and speak on messages that they want to deliver. And they don't want to be necessarily inside of not just big budget movies, but movies mm-hmm. that don't communicate too much and don't mm-hmm. really have much to say. So I, I think it's more like she wants to say something with her art and not just kind of get a paycheck and yeah, go with which the I think is important, right? I think yeah. you know when you're like when it's your job. Like I know with my job, if I'm not happy somewhere, I'm not going to work there anymore. If it's yeah. not, or if I get an offer and it's not an offer that I like, or I can't see myself doing it, like I'm not going to do it. Um, so I think that's very, very on the nose. Um, kind of going back into like the idea of like indies and low budgets. Like I'm still kind of figuring out film and everything in general, would you say, first of all, I guess, like, do you have a definition of like when people call something like an indie darling, like would, do you have a definition? Like what would, how would you kind of try to define that if you could? I mean, it changes every year to be honest, but yes, Mm -hmm. I I used to, I I, I don't know how many people even remember this, but I used to do indie picks uh, Uh on Schmoes uh, after Alicia left because Alicia definitely inspired me quite a bit. Uh, Alicia was cool, man. I used to hang out with yeah. Alicia back in the day. But Alicia Malone, shout out to Alicia Malone. If if you guys remember, she used to do indie picks, and that's something that I really took to heart and I loved. So I really dove deep into indie filmmaking those years. I want to say like 2016 to like 2018. I dove really, really deep, and I found so many like hidden gems. And that term is used a lot, but it's mm-hmm. true. It used to be like 10 mil. And then it was, it's like 15 mil uh-huh. and now it's like maybe 20, 20 you can get up to 25 mil uh-huh. where it's, it's considered an indie, like hereditary, a lot of mm-hmm. Ari Aster films, a lot of A24 films that aim to be, you know, 15, 20 and under. So that's probably what's considered to be indie, but indie also has a texture of what kind of film you're making, mm-hmm. right? Where you can't really call... I don't know, a, a, a franchise horror film, if it's made for 15 mil, is that an indie? No, it's not. Like, right. I don't know, the Scream films, for example, if they were made for cheap. That, right. I don't. I wouldn't consider that to be indie necessarily. So it's a complex definition. Yeah. For, sure. for sure. So then would you, based off of like the accolades that this one got from all the different indie film festivals and everything, would, would this be a movie that you would consider that idea of like an indie darling? Yeah, for sure. I mean, this okay. is like a, a again, I, I I forget the exact word, but it's considered like a super indie, yeah. which I think is anything under a, a million, uh, a million crazy. or two, but I think it's under a million is considered to be like micro indie or super indie, mm-hmm. whatever it's called. Uh, micro budget, I think is what mm-hmm. they call it. But yeah, this is like a definitely an indie, the most indie yeah. film. A24 <laughs> has made it a minute, so... I always like to think too, um, cause I think Blumhouse also does some pretty good, yes. like low budget. And I, my, the one that I always go to and I bring up when you talk about like micro budget or low budget films that actually turn out to be really amazing. And like top of my list for that is like upgrade. 
you know, this movie was made oh, for five yeah. million, right? Like made for five million, but it looks like it takes place like in the near future, but not super future. I with, love that um, movie. It's so good with with uh, Tom Hardy's like <laughs> ex. What's his name? Logan. <laughs> Logan. What is something? his name? I know I have to look it up, but uh, because he's it's also like Logan something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's the uh, what did what did it uh, on a previous episode? Um, Eric Mueller called him. He's the Tom Brady, Tom or Tom Hardy version of like when you tell your mom you want Tom Hardy, and she goes, "Oh, we have Tom Hardy at home." Like that's what he. <laughs> Yeah, he's he the like. discount brand, Walmart yeah, brand. Yeah, exactly. Logan Marshall Green is, is who it is. Um, but I, I know him like, because of uh, the Prometheus. That's yeah, what I know. Yeah, I covered that with uh, Taylor Robinson as well. Because that, that was the same, the same. Oh, it's so good. It's so I, good. I had a lot of fun with that one. And I'm not oh. like, besides, because that's the only other Alien movie, like Alien franchise movie I've seen besides Alien and Aliens. Like I've seen the, oh, wow. those first two. You haven't seen and Covenant? Then, no. Or the third, or Alien Cubed, or <laughs> oh yeah, the other aliens, yeah, or, or, or Resurrection, or whatever. Um, Predator movies. I went from seeing Predator to seeing 2018's The Predator, and then I saw Prey. So like, this is these are my gaps. This is why I now have a podcast all about watching movies for the first time because my gaps are wild. <laughs> the Alien franchise is another franchise I notoriously grew up with. I say notoriously because I was way too young to be watching <laughs> that. I mean, like three or four years old or five years old being <laughs> scarred for life. I'm still scarred to this day to the point that it's almost like, I don't know, like an itch I have to scratch yeah. every few years where I need an <laughs> alien film or an alien movie or something. Yeah, so yeah. that's a franchise that my brother and I, my whole family actually are like highly invested in. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I love, I love those films. Talking about like, a movie, I, I was asked or someone had asked like, what did I think was one of the greatest movie trailers of all time? And I'm pretty, and I, and I said 1979's Alien because Ooh. you don't, I, I think it, it doesn't get, it gives nothing away, Yeah. but you see, no one's talking right, but you're watching this tension slowly like build. And then at the end, it just says in space, no one can hear you scream. Dude. And it's like, Oh, and then of course I go and ride the great movie ride as a kid. Like, it took me until I was in my mid thirties to watch Alien, <laughs> like or, or like just about thirty years old until I finally watched it. So, <laughs> you know, there's that. Um, but kind of getting back into a ghost story, just talking about A twenty four in general. I always love asking people who are like A twenty four fans or things like that if they have like a top your your top like A twenty four movies. Like if you had to like name that maybe not in any order but if you had like three that you would if there's three a20 someone's like hey i want to start getting into like a24 what three movies would you recommend yeah this is obviously a question that i should have been prepped for but <laughs> i'll i'll go off and say off the top of my head i know for sure um hereditary is definitely one of them okay i feel like how come it won't come up on my feed uh okay how about this so for me hereditary is definitely up there I, I would highly recommend it a ghost story obviously i just said and we're talking about it right now uh -huh. i want to say is ladybird a24 i think it is i think i love ladybird i think ladybird is definitely one of my favorites as well um i can name a lot if 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 <laughs> Yes, Lady know, Bird is A24. It is. Lady Bird and then The Farewell, Minari. Okay. It just, it's a recent one, but it, those, those films are, are beautiful for sure. Uh, I've not that's, seen that's Farewell probably... or Minari, but I've been wanting to. Th those have been like on my list. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. Probably will never see Hereditary. And it's oh, only no way. Because, it's because I don't do scary. Like... Mm. When I say like I've gotten better at when when my own husband will say you cannot watch this movie, I know I shouldn't be watching that movie. So that one, and was, I've heard lots yeah. about it. <laughs> but like when my husband comes home from the theaters after seeing something and looks at me and he goes, "You would hate it," I'm like, "I'm never gonna watch it. Nope, never gonna it's, do it." <laughs> it's tough. It's definitely tough for sure. I I had a recent conversation with a friend of mine talking about like. There's levels to horror. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm also a big baby when it comes to horror. And that was hard for me. Yeah. <laughs> so hard. And I watched it in theaters. And mm. I was like, oh, my God. I, I don't know if I can handle this. And then, yeah. you know, for example, have you seen It, for example? 
So uh, of, I did see it, but we had see, stipulations with watching it as I had to, my, the rules were for me to, cause what my husband does is he does this whole, like, we should watch it or we should watch and just like annoys me until I give in. And yeah. so I'm like, here's the rules. Middle of the day, lights are on, window like blinds are open. I don't give a shit if there's a glare on the TV. If I want to look at my phone, if I want to not watch, if I want to talk and ask you questions throughout the entire thing, I can do all of these things. And I'll watch it with you. Like that's how yeah. that's how we agree to it because I get so scared. That that's my thing. I feel like there's a lot I, I talked about the levels of horror. It could still be rated R, it could still be considered horror, but like it is like a baby's movie compared to like, I don't know, a hereditary, for example. Yeah. Or someone mentioned like, what about thrillers like Get Out or the the mm -hmm. one with the crazy old man killing people in his home? Uh, oh. I forget. The one where he's like name. all blind and everything. Yeah, that's another yeah. one. Or like the green room where it's like super violent and gory, mm -hmm. but it's just like guys attacking you. That's never that scary to me. But I will never, and I will say this right now, you cannot pay me, and it just came out this weekend, to watch any Evil Dead. No. Hell no. Evil no, Dead no. Rise, That this trailer freaks me out. <laughs> always play it like i turn on tv to like fall asleep at night and because it's like 10 o'clock at night that's the trailer that they're playing yeah. in the court and i'm like i'm awake this is yeah, great no way. um no way. the first three evil dead movies were fantastic covered that with a uh, friend of the show pj campbell that was fine i could handle that yeah. um no i saw i watched the trailer for evil dead rise i'm like mm, i'm good no thank you Same. we're we're okay we're good we're good and i sat i made it through barbarian so i'm kind of brave i've like lifted my brave meter like a little bit but i think like barbarian and like x like those kind of that's like probably where i draw my line now like that's how like brave i'm going to get <laughs> in any of, of these these movies um i also think when when it comes to like a24 movies i think some of them, i i loved lady bird i think that one was amazing um i mean i i recency bias probably but um everything everywhere all at once would be one of my like top ones to tell people and i would even go with pearl i watched pearl um i didn't get to see it in theaters but you want to talk about a stellar performance and mia goth like mm. holy shit like you talk about like a long um a long shot where at the end when they're playing the credits and she's just standing there smiling but also crying at the same time was just again it's so annoying that like awards shows like refuse yeah. to look at like horror as a genre because that's mia goth's performance in pearl is probably one of the best performances of 2021 that's how i feel about and i know he's in the news right now as well because his film is coming out or came out uh midsummer that's how i feel about midsummer yeah. i don't know if you saw midsummer i did not florence Pugh just like throws haymakers in that movie i was yeah. blown away i literally said on my podcast i was like that should be oscar nominated performance in midsummer i thought she was that good for sure that's all yeah no i midsummer has been on the list i've always been a little nervous that it's too scary for me but i might i might dive into that one on the show at some point um so with the ghost story and a24 and we're talking about kind of scenes and moments and 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 things like that what if you had to list your top three moments in um in a, a a ghost story what would they be it's it's definitely tough because i feel like a lot of it is just the scene where he's it's just one scene a ghost cheat and he's standing there and it's crazy um mm -hmm. but I, if if i had to pick i definitely the first one that comes to mind is the one we've already talked about a little bit but it's the the pie scene uh, yeah. i remember I remember someone saw this movie early on Twitter and I don't know if I was at a festival or something and they were like, yeah, Rooney Mara eats a pie for five minutes. It's so dumb and weird. And I was like, okay, that sounds interesting to me. And then I saw the scene and I was expecting dumb and weird. And I was like, this is brutally emotional. Uh -huh. And I was moved in that scene. I don't know how you felt, but to me, I, I felt it like that scene so communicated heavy. so much about like you said before, grief and pain and dealing with it and mm -hmm. just so much emotion she showed in that scene. And I love that um, she did an interview afterwards where she said, where it turns out that that pie scene, she said like it was the first and last time she will ever eat pie. Like she had apparently yeah. never had pie before then and she never wants to eat it again. 
Yeah, that's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is. Um, that I had that one down too. Um, another scene that I had is that conversation at the table scene with like the yeah. party that's going on. Um, that's kind of like the last group to live in the house. I think what this movie does extremely well by having such limited dialogue is when it does have dialogue, it makes it count. Yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 it's not like a Tarantino where it's just, which I love. I love a fast dialogue film. I love a Aaron Sorkin written like a minute of dialogue, a page kind of thing. Like I, I, I also am very intrigued by that. And I, and I like when you can do that, but in this scenario where there's very limited dialogue, when someone speaks, there's, there's, you feel like there's a reason behind it versus just filling the void of silence. Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely one for sure. I would say another one might be the one where she shows him, where he shows her his song. Yes. And a lot of it is just cutting back and forth between him as a ghost and him before and her mm -hmm. before and her kind of experiencing that song past and present, right? And mm -hmm. it's going back and forth, back and forth. The music is cutting, cutting in and out. It's getting quieter and louder. I really like that scene. And, and again, a lot of that scene, again, is Rooney Mara because it's yeah. like three minutes of the song is just her face on yeah. screen. So I and thought that scene was beautiful. It's a gorgeous song. And it's yeah. something that, again, I listened to it on my way home. And it's a song that's, it's, it almost feels like that song was written for the movie, even if it wasn't. Yeah. It's, again, just that use of, this is going to be the one like soundtrack song we're going to put in versus like a score. Like if we're going to have a song that we want to be right, that we want to have a part of it, it's this one. That whole, I had that as another one of mine was just because that whole scene of her with the headphones and the go, oh, like it gives, I have goosebumps just talking about it right now. Cause again, we talked about how much the music meant in a movie like this. And for that to be done it, I, I started crying watching it as like, it's going on. I mean, it's just, oh, it's used so well. And then I also, when I got really sad when the, both the houses got demoed and Casey Affleck and the other ghosts are looking at each other and the ghost just goes, I don't think they're coming and disappears. It just yeah. like, oh, like, it's like, it, it literally like, it's just, okay, where'd you go? Did you move on? Are we able to move on now? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, it, it's oh. a very emotional movie. And I feel like that's that's something that I think a, a lot of people, I, I feel like recently in films, emotional effect has been kind of, I don't want to say like underrated in my opinion, mm -hmm. because I feel like a lot of people have been like, oh, it's emotional. Who cares? It's still a bad movie. And it's like, if you make, if it makes you feel that emotional, I don't know if it's a bad movie. I really yep. do feel like, making you feel that kind of emotion, like heavy emotion, is a powerful tool that filmmaking has. And I feel like this movie does that beautifully. I think, I think, and I think that you make a really good point that I also think, you know, on top of it, like when a movie makes you feel something, just because I said earlier that, is this one that I'm going to frequently go back to? Probably not because I don't want to feel those emotions, but let's, if, but I'm also one of those people where if I am in a mood where like, I need to cry and just like, break down <laughs> intensely i might add it to my list along with harry potter and the deathly hallows part two when snape dies <laughs> like that might be added to like the list of like things i need to watch when i need a good cry and i'm not mad at it <laughs> yeah I, and i think it does it in a beautiful manner in a way that it, it communicates so much and it makes mm -hmm. you think about so many things about life and death and the journey and everything mm -hmm. so yeah and i think it does it in such a good meaningful because eventually you know Rooney Mara does move and people other people do come into this I also think another thing um even before like wrapping everything up one thing I noticed in the movie that I really appreciate that David Lowry did is he didn't use subtitles when the Spanish-speaking family was living in the house like you're just what he's literally just watching life go on and he's stuck and I think the not using this up much like how Steven Spielberg didn't use the subtitles in West Side Story. It felt very purposeful and I really enjoyed that aspect. Yeah. I mean, obviously I always appreciate that when it's Spanish and I can understand what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just like, yeah, I totally got that. And everyone else doesn't get it, but I, 
I, I feel like there's something to be said. It could be the same for me if I watch something mm-hmm. that has a scene like that or a couple scenes like that in Japanese or Korean, uh, uh-huh. because I watch a lot of those as well. So I, I, I enjoy when filmmakers do that as well, because I still feel like you can get a lot of what they're trying to say mm-hmm. in those scenes. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. This movie, I'm I'm very thankful that this is what you wanted to talk about because I do not think I would have watched this movie any other way because I don't think I even really knew about it. So um, I'm that's, it's why, again, I, say it, I feel like I say it every single episode. It's why I started this podcast to begin with is even on days where it starts to kind of feel like a chore, I get to watch something like a ghost story and be introduced to something that I never would have sought out on my own. So thank you for for not only coming on but bringing making this the the suggestion for it absolutely thank you for for having me on and i'm glad you enjoyed it for sure i really did so with that being said it's time to go into my letterboxd account where we're gonna rate this out of five stars um because that's how i feel like a critic um i don't write anything else i just say one through five stars and that is it um so with that being said everything we kind of talked about to me for this first watch, I would say absolutely without a doubt, four star film, not quite at five stars yet. I might need to give it another watch now that I know what we're looking at, but definitely four stars. It's definitely up there um, for probably one of one of my favorite movies that I've covered so far on this podcast. Awesome. That's really cool to hear. It's actually <laughs> in my, I haven't used all the box in like four years or whatever, yeah. <laughs> but it's in my top four in Letterboxd. It's actually- That's awesome. There. Yeah. yeah, this will this will probably end up at least by like I I rate them I like I rank them like in a list as I go um once when when episodes release. So I can guarantee at this point, this one will probably end up at least so far in like the top 10 of the movies covered this year um for this podcast. So that's pretty cool. I mean, I don't know. I might who knows what else I'm gonna watch, but like this one is definitely gonna be super high up there. So Thank you again for bringing this one to my attention. And now I know that I own it. I can watch it whenever I want to. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so anyway, Ace, before we get out of here and, and end the show, um, why don't you let all of my listeners and viewers know where they can find you and anything you got going on? Yeah, you could find me on Twitter and Instagram at Squad Leader Ace and also my channel at First Cut. We're also on Instagram and Twitter and on TikTok as well. And also I have in TikTok as well, I guess now. I guess I have a TikTok. But yeah, you can find me there. What what do we do? What is TikTok? Um, I know. I think (laughs) Flick and Reel definitely has a TikTok. I don't use it. Um, And to all of you who are watching here on YouTube, thank you so much. And as well as listening on your audio platform of choice, if you are watching on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Leave a quick thumbs up on this video. Leave your thoughts in the comments as well of a ghost story or your favorite A24 films. If you're listening on an audio platform, make sure you have subscribed, rate, and reviewed there as well. Uh, You can follow the show on Twitter at reels like movies and you can follow me at allison salamony and until next time my friends be safe i have to go watch some more movies see ya